Hey everybody, it's Jim Johnson here, the head coach at Contractor Coach Pro and your host with Contractor Radio. We, we are here to educate you, hopefully entertain you a little bit, help you with this strategy and tactics to move your business forward as you continue to grow your business. Our whole intention is to help you get control of your business so you can grow it and find that personal and financial freedom that you've been chasing since you started your business. And I'm super excited uh, today because we're going to be talking about uh, the stages that a contractor goes through uh, in their life cycle and these ceilings or barriers that they have to break through. And I was racking my brain, like, who are some of the best guys that I know uh, that we can have that conversation with? And uh, I, I brought two of them in today uh, to have that conversation. But before we do that, uh, we got to pay the bills. So we're going to have a little word from one of our sponsors. And we'll be right back. Don't miss this show. It's going to be super important for your understanding of what you might have to do to grow your business. The Atlas Pro Plus Contractor Program is designed to help you build your business. It gives you tools and resources, training, industry insights, bonus structures, technical knowledge, the brand power and science of 3M Scotchgard, and what we think is the best product and warranty in the industry. Become part of the family that is succeeding and growing their businesses. We went from nobody ever heard of us to the number one roofing company in our region. And we've gone from 12 roofs a year to 20, 35, and we did over 400 last year. We're on track right now to do a thousand roofs this year. You'll begin earning Atlas bucks and rewards as you move up to even greater reward levels. Become an Atlas Pro today. All right, if you guys haven't checked out Atlas for all of your roofing needs, you need to. Uh, these guys are amazing at helping their contractors grow their business. And uh, so that perfectly aligns with us. And today, that's what we're here to talk about, how to grow your business and go through the stages uh, that uh, contractors go through because we keep hitting barriers. We have these ceilings. And over the last eight years or so, we have uh, started to identify where those are and why they happen. And uh, I've brought in two uh, rock stars that understand this that uh, just happen to be our coaches. Uh, Coach Nathan Thibodeau, welcome aboard, sir. Good to have you. And Good afternoon. And Dave Harrison, uh, I think his nickname is the father of the contractor program. And so uh, I, that's it's awesome to have you, Dave. Glad to have you aboard. Thanks. I really enjoy being part of this team. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun working with you guys. Um, we've got to see so much in, in our history. You know, I've been doing this as a contractor in the contractor industry for the last 23 years or so. Uh, Nathan, how many years for you? 25. 25, longer than me. Um, but he's still younger than me. And then uh, we got Dave. Dave, how many how many years you got into it at this point? Man, it's a lot of years. I can still remember in March of 97, working a PowerPoint and writing out the concept of Master Elite and Golden Pledge and Authorized and System Plus and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's been a lot of years in a, in a great run. What a great industry. Yeah, so if I do the math, that's almost 75 years of experience between the three of us watching contractors grow or being a contractor that grew. And so today, um, what I hope to do is to give the listeners some understanding um, in the stages that they go through as a contractor, what some of those barriers might be uh, to growing as a contractor. And uh, so let's start off with like, why does a guy decide to be a contractor in the first place? Dave, how about you? Why don't you start with that one? Well, in general, my experience has been, uh, most people tell you they got into this industry by accident, right? And it's either on the sales side or the installation side, they started and it was, hey, they needed a job. They started working for someone. And after a while they said, you know, I'm not gonna be driving a car like my boss there doing what I'm doing. I know how to measure. I know how to get guys to work with me. I drink with them on Friday and Saturday nights. I'm going to start my own firm. And they start out. And how's it start? Well, first, the solo. It's just me, and I know what to do. Then it's the second stage. I call it the friend stage. And that's a just do it. <laughs> it's my way. I know what I'm doing. Uh, then it's sort of the 
evolves to the team stage and says, wow, we're really rocking. We're awesome. And now they're up to a million or a million and a half and, and things are great. And then all of a sudden chaos hits and chaos was, you know, this isn't as much fun anymore. And I wonder if we're as great as I thought, maybe I got to switch out some of these guys, but I can't cause they're my friends. And then the frustration of, I don't know what to do. Um, maybe this is just the way it's always going to be. This isn't what I pictured. But on the other hand, I'm making a living. This is what I'm doing. And where do I go from here? And that seems to be the evolution of the first few years of a contract. How about you, Nathan? What, what do you see? And, you know, you've, you've been here for uh, three and a half years now, three years, four years almost. Um, I can't remember. It's, it's been so long. It's like he's just part of the family at this point. Like forever, right? Yeah, it seems like forever. <laughs> uh, but you've gotten to watch several of our clients and, and a lot of your clients go through this growth thing. Um, what, what do you see as these contractors are like kind of start out and then start to hit these barriers? Well, uh, there's some there's some pretty major milestones that guys go through that they don't realize some, oftentimes they don't realize they pass these milestones and they should give themselves a high five and a pat on the back for it. One of those first milestones is if you've been in business for more than two years, that's a big one. It's, it's, it's over 80, it's gotta be close to 90% of contractors. Um, they go out of business inside of two years. So if you've cracked that two year mark, man, give yourself a high five. You're, you're in a very elite group of people, even though that bar seems pretty low. Um, I would say that next milestone uh, that contractors hit, I think there's a half a milestone in there. I was going to say the next milestone is probably your first million or million and a half um, in, in revenue. Um, is amount, But I think there's a middle one. I think there's a middle one and, it's, and it's, it's like a half milestone. And it's probably somewhere around that like seven to 800,000 number, right? Because... That's like you can make a I mean, you can make a pretty good living just doing 500 grand in revenue and your life isn't terribly stressful and you make a decent money. But when you start cracking that 800,000, you start seeing that next milestone and you have the decision. Am I going to stay here and do OK or am I going to try and do OK heading to that next level? So there's kind of like a half milestone in there, I feel like. Um, and then the next one's that million to million and a half. Um, that's when you start realizing, I mean, as organized and as powerful as you might be, you start realizing if I have to do this again, I'm either going to close the doors or I'm going to kill myself, or I'm going to need to build a team of people. I need some help because I can't just keep doing it this way. And then from there, I think probably five years is your next time milestone. Cause if you're in business more than five years, that rest of that group that didn't go out of business they've all gone out of business inside of five years. And then you're pushing to 5 million, eight to 10, and then on you go. So those are, those are, I would say probably those big milestones. And I think a lot of the guys that we talk to, they've hit those first two or three and they're so busy. They don't realize that they're in, they're in the minority of contractors. So I see those as, as uh, some milestones people really should, you know, be proud. I mean, if you've been in business for three years, man, the high five, Good for you. Yeah, you're in the 20% at that point. If you've been in business for uh, three years, you're in the 20% because uh, 80% of uh, contractors go out of business the first three years. Um, you are also in the top 10% if you've broken a million dollars. If you've broken a million dollars, I put you in the top 10%. I did a little study in before our podcast today to figure out those numbers. And uh, so that is, that's a pat on the back and a high five, like, well done. But when we get there, at least through what I've observed, uh, what happens is it goes from just being me to now I got to incorporate somebody else. And uh, usually that person that gets incorporated could be a family member, usually very close, like a wife, spouse, girlfriend, best friend, that type of thing. Um, sometimes I see mom. Mom like steps in and handles the paperwork and the books and that kind of stuff because you find you need the help. You need the help uh, in the areas that uh, may not be your strength. And so that's kind of like you got this startup phase and then stage one is I need some help. And once you start to incorporate help, um, all communication becomes much different. All the communication before was in your melon, right? It's between you and, and whatever you say in the mirror to yourself. But the second you bring somebody else into the equation, 
communication starts to be a part of it. And so where, where does that break down for people? You know, that, that part where you bring this person in and, and where does that break down in that stage one contractor that's moving forward? Yeah. Jim, if I can use an analogy, there's a very successful magazine in the business world called Inc. Magazine, right? And a lot of people know Inc. And if you ask the publishers, because I remember the guy who founded it, he said, why are you successful? And he goes, because every industry faces, every entrepreneur faces what we do. I go, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, there's a huge difference between the skills for startup and using what Nathan shared. Maybe that's through a million, million and a half, whatever that number is. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just get it done. And you can get away with it. You can get away with it verbally. You can get away with your friends. You can get away with it. The people, the small team that you hire, you can get away with it. And why is there an Inc. magazine? Because that's where failure hits small businesses. And it hits it for one of two reasons. Either one, it outgrows the ability of, well, all we have to do is get it done. Because something steps in. It's called A, leadership. It's called B, culture. It's got three processes. It's got four, holding a pe- accountability. It's got all these different dimensions that once you pass through that million and a half, $2 million range, you can't succeed long term without that professionalism that's going to kick in. And that's a whole separate set of skills. So Inc. Magazine, as an example, as an analogy here, you either learn how to break through those or you crash or you simmer back down and say, you know what, I'm going to just have to stay three quarters of a million to a million and a half and be happy with that. And, and that's what makes, frankly, why I have so much fun being part of Jim organization is we're sort of like the Inc. magazine of the contractor business world. We're the people who step in and say, hey, we got insight into that and we can help you break through it. <laughs> I love it. Hey, man, let's we should brand that. Uh, that is, that's a that's that's a fantastic analogy. Um, I've always kind of looked at it as like we become professional hat makers. And, and so we make all these hats. We put them all on our head at the same time. We are the production guru, the sales guru, uh, the administrative guru, collections guru, problem solver, fire putter outer, and all these different hats that we're wearing. And uh, the, the difference becomes when I know how to make that hat for somebody else. And not to like take the hat off and put it on their head and say, you're now the firefighter. It's like I put it on your head and uh, I've given you the tools to fight the fires with. And so it's a, it's a different mindset. And, and so, Nathan, that kind of comes to you the way you perceive a lot of this. Uh, talk a little bit about that and this uh, shift that we have to have in mindset as contractors. Um, I think a natural mindset shift, which I really appreciate. So another high five to contractors is somewhere around that. One of these milestones is that level of desperation that starts to occur. Like, I don't know what I'm, I'm feeling like I'm not entirely sure what I'm doing and I'm a little afraid of where I'm going to end up. Um, and so I think a lot of guys, when they start to hit some of those real stressful moments and they're facing those decisions that, that Dave was talking about, um, they start looking around for help, which I think is cool, right? They start reading books like the E-Myth, right? Which is a really good one. Like every time a small business owner discovers the E-Myth, they feel like they just found the Bible of business management, um, which is a great book. So don't, yes. don't hear me wrong. If you, if you haven't read that book, you should go read it. Um, and it's not about the internet. <laughs> what's, what's that? And it's not about the internet. When you first see the title, you go, Oh, it looks like a computer book. Right. It's not about the internet. Um, but uh, they start getting this idea that they need some help. And so then they start looking around for help. And man, these days between YouTube and podcasts and gurus and people selling books and all kinds like, there's a million different places you could go to get a little bit of help and advice on how to break through. Um but one of, I think, the, the primary um, shifts in mindset that needs to happen after the idea of getting help is that that same grind and effort and pursuit that you had that got you to where you were with that energy now needs to get redirected somewhat. 
and there is no silver bullet. So just because a guy got on stage and said you need to build a killer sales team doesn't mean that you need to pour every ounce of your time into trying to build 20 sales guys. Okay, just because somebody said that you you need to track your finances all the way down to the penny, not bad advice. Okay, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to go um, we need to go hire a full time bookkeeper right this second. The mindset shift starts to become okay. I am a finite person with a finite amount of attention and energy, and I have some talents and experiences. How can I strategize? what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in order to create uh, more resources to be reinvested back into my company? And how can I, who would be the next person I bring into my world to allow me to accomplish that exact thing, right? And it's a continue, it's, you're still on the grind, man. Like you're not just going to hire an office manager and then get to go on vacation as much as we'd all love to do that. I'm not entirely sure what a vacation is. I've heard they're nice. Um, but I know we all want to try and take one, right? Jim's, yeah, Jim's now. Nah, you literally just got back from one. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's, that's part of that mindset shift is that, is that there's not a silver bullet. Number one, number two, where are your talents and where are your abilities? And we shouldn't just hire somebody else hoping that they can magically wear as many hats as we do. They should be a strategic hire to take some of those things that maybe we're not great at or don't like doing, but that create space for us to attack the things we are good at. That was one of my uh, big epiphanies as, as somebody that is entrepreneurial. You know, I've opened several businesses. I used to always think I really needed to work on my weaknesses. Like uh, I was weak at administration. I was weak at detail. I was weak at, you know, a lot of things, to be honest with you. And uh, I got some great coaching advice. It was one of the smartest moves I ever made was getting my own coach. And uh, he says, why are you doing that? Why are you trying to be good at something you suck at? Why don't you just hire somebody to do that part that's really great at it and then go do what you do well because you're a great recruiter, you're a great motivator, you're a great coach, and you're great at sales. Why don't you go do that? Yeah, like, we're not above a shameless plug for coaching, by the way. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> Coaching is important. I, I find it – come on. All the greatest athletes, all the greatest CEOs all have coaches. They all have coaches, and they, there's a reason they do because they need some insight. They need some understanding. And if I heard you guys right as you were going through your descriptions there – um. We tend to get distracted with the newest, shiniest object or silver bullet or whatever we think is going to solve our problem. You know, we go to conferences, we go to events, we watch them on, now that things are virtual. There's all kinds of things going on out there. And uh, we go to you know something on sales or something on marketing or something on recruiting or supplementing or whatever it is that you're needing help with. And you go, I got to do that right now. That sounds so good. But is it the right time and place strategically for you to do that thing if you don't have all these other things kind of lined out first. That's, that's the thing that the speaker always leaves out. Yeah, I went out and hired 20 guys and I grew my business. But what he didn't tell you is that he had job descriptions already laid out. He had a compensation plan already figured out. He knew exactly how he was going to train them and where he was going to recruit them from. And he did all that stuff first before he went out and got the 20 guys. So are you saying so, that, uh, preparing to grow doesn't mean you just run out and rent a 50,000 square foot building? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Okay. All right, good. It, it's kind of, it really comes down to knowing what to do and when. And that's been, I guess, kind of our epiphany here. You know, whenever I started this whole coaching thing, it was, I knew I was really good at these aspects of the business. Not all of them, but these eight really core ones. Um, since then, I did what we're talking about today. I went out and hired some people that are better at things than me, and we added four more core concepts to our coaching program. But uh, I knew I had to get those people, and I knew that the only way we were going to do what we needed to do to really truly serve the contract was to find the right people for that. And so um, all of that had to be done at the right time and the right place. And before I could start going out and hiring anybody, I hopefully had some kind of structure for them to come into, or at least a plan on how to bring them up to the speed that they needed to be. And I see this a lot with contractors. They tend to be very um, verbal in the beginning. 
uh, information is translated verbally for their job description, expectations, performance requirements, and things like that, then how to do the job and what to do on the job, which takes an immense amount of time. It takes a long time to get there. And uh, But if we, if we lay it all out first and say, hey, this is the exact program, it can go a lot faster. How, what do you guys think about that, like being a little more proactive instead of reactive? Well, a few things on that, and if I can even talk about it in terms of stages. So one of the things I've seen with some of the people that we coach. So let's take someone who's small and sort of just starting out. And I'll be on a call, you know, Nathan and I will share a call. And one of the things we hear is, well, I'm going to go out. Uh, I think the first thing I got to do is go out and hire a salesperson. And I've already got a guy to help me. Um, I got a guy from a production. And I remember, actually, I called just last week. Nathan goes, why are you going to hire a salesperson? Well, because I got to grow my business. I think I got to grow my salesperson. And Nathan goes, what are you absolutely best at doing? And he goes, well, I'm really good at sales. And I remember Nathan goes, you know, you might be better off. If you think of your hour, take what's an hour of your time worth when it's in sales mode in that hat versus how much are you generating in value when you're in administrative mode? Maybe you ought to start off getting a really good administrator and keep doing what you do best. I mean, one of the interesting things sometimes you see with entrepreneurs is what they're best at. They think owning a company, well, I want to get out of what I'm doing best at as quick as I can so I can be the decision maker. And here's the weirdest part of that evolution. We'll call it at We'll call it for now the, the ink moment. You know, am I going to fall apart or not? It's that moment that you realize the best leaders are not great leaders because of their ability to make great decisions. They're mm. great leaders because of their ability to create great leaders. They're great because their ability to help set up processes and set up outcomes that they expect and let the leaders that they develop achieve them. And then there's one other key part to that that I see over and over and over and over again at this so-called, we'll call it an awkward stage. Let's call it the, the teenage awkward years of being an entrepreneur. It's the word delegation, right? And here's my rule of thumb on delegation. If you can find somebody who 70% of the time would have done it pretty much the way you would have done it, 25% of the time you're looking at it and saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did it that way, but it got to a decent outcome. And 5% of the time you want to throw up. You can't <laughs> believe what they did. <laughs> if you can delegate to somebody with a 70-25-5 ratio, you've got a great employee and you better delegate all day long. And if you can't get to that mindset, you'll never really be able to scale your company because you'll never be able to delegate. And mm. that's the that biggest transition situation. Entrepreneurs know how they want it done. But at a point, you've got to change your mindset to what's the outcome that I want to achieve and build a team that's committed to getting it done. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with that. This, this constant... And I'm going to ask you a question. I, I'm I'm a million bucks, right? I'm doing it on my own. Maybe I got a little bit of help, but I, I want to grow the thing. Um, would I say, hey, I'm going to go hire this person and tell them this is the outcome I want and uh, and hopefully hire the right person? Or would I take a little bit of time and lay out the structure for how they get to that outcome. Not, not not the plan step by step by step, but hey, here's a great job description. Here's the process we currently use. Here's the tools that we currently have available to us. This is the goal I want to achieve. You have the skill set to get there. Would we take that step back first before we necessarily hire somebody? You know, that's a great question. Now, in the case of contractor coach pro specifically, the answer is very easy. Promote Nathan. Now, <laughs> talking about the people on this podcast that we're talking to. No, it's not an it's not a flip of the switch type thing. It's more like a a switch that you can dim 
and bring up highlight, but I can share with you the conceptually the key thing it is, because it's not all one or all the other, right? But here's a few things it is. It's working with the people together to develop the process. And why do I say working with them on it? Because if you work with them on it, they own it. Two, when you work on the process, the key part is sharing not just who, what, when, where, how you want things done, the causes. The key thing is that they understand the why. Because if they understand the why, they have permission to make contributions to it because they have insight into that. That's two. Three. And so what does it mean as a mindset? What's the difference between a great leader and a good leader? A great leader in that awkward stage shit starts shifting more to leading through the questions they ask versus things that they tell. And the amazing thing is when you learn, and it's a you have to learn it. You need a Frankly, it's a place a lot of people need a coach. It's not natural at first. But when you learn to lead through questions, you can do anything through a question. You can suggest how to do something, but they still own it. You can uncover information on how to overcome an obstacle. You can, you can do anything through a question. But when you do it through a question, they're engaged. They trust. You're demonstrating respect. You demonstrate you care. And now they own that process that you put in place. And you can now go on to work on something else. And that's what I mean about developing leaders. If you give people the sense of what and why and how things can go wrong, they're part of helping set up a process to prevent bad things from happening. And they understand the why. As a leader, you can go on to the next thing. But when you tell them what to do, you still own it. You do that's, that's, you them, you, they own it. That's, that's great advice. I mean, you know, if you're going to start to grow your business, you've got to start to learn uh, some of these habits that we have as leaders. Uh, first one is being able to ask great questions and, and just understanding the value of that. If I if I'm hearing things correctly, um, we we I think our mistake is made fairly early on. I think it's made way before we hit the million dollar mark and we decide we want to grow. Um, the mistake is we decide we're going to grow and we, we bring people in, we bring another person on. Maybe we do it right. Maybe we do it wrong. But whatever we're doing, we're bringing people into this equation without any real structure or plan for what that's going to look like in the long run. And w- I always call it putting the cart in front of the horse, right? Like we know we can hire salespeople to go sell more jobs. And so what we don't realize is that when we sell those more jobs, how are we going to produce them? How are we going to get the more crews that we need? What process are they going to follow that makes that um, an assembly line instead of this guy doing it this way and this guy doing it this way? And then we make these common mistakes of like, hey, I'm going to hire this sales guy on this commission structure. I'm going to hire this sales guy on that commission structure. And then this guy on that. Con- and then whoever is handling the books, whether it be you or somebody that you've put in place, now has three different systems that they've got to manage. So now it becomes much more complicated. And so you're creating because of how we position ourselves early on you're creating chaos is going to hit your world down the road. You think, hey, I'm going to bring some people in, be great, my buddies, my friends, and all that other good stuff, and everything's going to be wonderful. But you didn't put procedures in place that took care of behavior, took care of process, took care of what happens when things go wrong. And then it starts to become constant firefighter mode trying to answer all those questions all the time. Would you say that's kind of the first barrier, that first barrier of going from this smaller contractor to that next stage is is thinking that way jim can i use if i can use an analogy right that most of us can relate to whether you played sports or not let's say you had a kid a son he's 14 years old he decided to go and try it for the football team and you go okay that's pretty good went to the football team and he brings home a notebook and you say oh you got the playbook the offensive plays the defensive plays he goes, actually, no, Dad, I don't have any plays in here. We just have, you know, just some information about the team and when we practice and stuff. And a week later, he comes home and there's still no plays. What do you think that chances are of that team being a winning team? 
unless they have some absolutely amazing talent that figures it out on their own, they're going to suck. They're going to suck. And here's what's bizarre about that. A lot of us in this industry played high school sports. We would fire a high school coach that didn't have plays written out and discussed with the team, and they understood why those plays and what they were trying to – we'd fire a high school coach for not having that. Yeah, and that and those coaches even start before that. They start with, all right, this is this is our running drill and this is our tackling drill and whatever sport it is, a passing drill, hitting drill. There's all the fundamental stuff that they put in place first, and then they grow uh, the skill on top of that, repetitive and, and reinforcement. Exactly. Nobody, ever, nobody ever rode a bike the first time. No, no. And and when you think about it, just like with individuals and just like with a team. What's the coach driving towards? He's driving towards we've got different strategies and approaches to get something done, and we've got to develop the habits. And what are the habits? The things that we've done it so often, we just do it the right way naturally. Yeah, it becomes natural. Um, it becomes natural. And, and again, I'm just going to use the high school analogy, all right? And some people comes naturally quicker. And you know what? Some people, they can be really good players – but the habit doesn't happen as quickly. So what does the coach do? Coaches watches the, the plays, the video Sunday, has the practice Monday, looks at what didn't go right. And he knows there's only three reasons anything didn't go right, which he couldn't do without a play. Either someone didn't understand it. Okay, good coach. I'm going to go help that player understand the play, why, whatever, go through it again so they can get towards it being a habit. Two. The play doesn't work. We're going to modify the play. Okay, we modify the play and work on the slight changes in in practice. Or three, hey, you know what? This player, either their attitude or their capability is not getting it done. We got to let them know, you know, that's your responsibility. We'll work with you and help you. you so, my so what you're saying is my quarterback just became alignment. Yeah. <laughs> He's just in the wrong seat on the bus. But, but here's the weird little point about all this. The keys to building a really good business, a lot of it we learned in high school. We forgot what we learned. It's relationships yeah. and teamwork. Yeah, it's really good. Um, and it's, you know, everybody I think gets really confused and, and really feels daunted by the concept of, okay, if I'm really going to grow my business, I need to like build this business plan, right? Like I really, and I don't even really know how to build a business plan. I don't even know where to start. And uh, so they just don't ever take the task on and they don't have anybody to really help them with that because they're all, I always wonder if they're asking the wrong question. Uh, The question is, how do I sell more jobs? How do I hire more people? Um, How do I build better? And uh, it's not the question of what do I do when? Because I think that's the bigger question. The bigger question is there's an order to this thing. And where am I in this order and what do I need to focus on right now for my business? Because it could be very different from the person you're listening to, learning from, book you're reading, podcast, whatever it is. And so, Nathan, I want to I want to bring you into this equation because this is where you really shine. Um, what, what does that contractor have to come to first before all this other stuff happens? See if I led you right there. <laughs> um. I think there's some key components that have to be identified really. Um, so for example, um, if you want to go, um, 15 miles an hour on a bicycle, you can make a bicycle that can go 15 miles an hour. Right. Um, and you need, you need some tires, you need some wheels, you need a chain, you need a seat, you need a, you know, a couple of key components to make that thing go that speed. Well, what if you want to go, 50 miles an hour. Probably not going to do that with a bicycle, right? So going downhill. That's that's right. So uh, at least I don't know of anybody who pedals at 50 miles an hour on a, on a flat street. Um, So, so then like those basic components are still needed. So you want to be careful before you go leaning too heavy into one particular thing. Like we still, we still need sales. We still need production and we still need administration. Like those things, we need those three major pillars inside of our business. 
And I think really uh, where people get caught up sometimes is how deep into each one of those sections do they need to go and at what, at what point do they need to go that deep? So I think culture is a really good example. We preach that from the mountaintops. We love culture. As a matter of fact, the most successful companies we've ever dealt with or worked with, um, their cultures are usually the strongest. What, what, what did we say? Uh, culture kills. Culture eats strategy. Culture eats strategy. There we go. Right. And I feel silly. I didn't know that. Culture eats strategy. Okay. Now, if we're the one man show who just did a million bucks, okay, do I need to go 10 layers deep into my culture before I can do 2 million? Probably not. But do I avoid culture altogether? Also, probably not. OK, um, when it comes to building your step by step processes, do I have to have an extremely robust step by step process that builds out every possible contingency that has 10 different um, roles that are that are involved? Probably not. Should I avoid step by step process altogether? Also, no. How deep into each of these components do I need to get to get to 15 miles an hour? Right. And as your company builds, if you understand those components, this is the thing that's interesting. I think if you understand that those components exist and you've got somebody to help you understand how deep you need to go into those components so that you're not just diving headfirst into something that's going to eat up a lot of time, but not really give you any kind of ROI. If you understand that those components exist, then you're able to add them as you go. If we want to go 50 miles an hour, we're probably going to need to move away from the pedals and start thinking about some sort of motor of some kind, right? And uh, those tires on the bike, those tires on that bike are not going to do well at 50 miles an hour. We'll probably die. So we need to think about better set of tires, probably also a different set of wheels, right? So that's when we start digging deeper into those different components. And it helps to have a little bit of guidance. People who've done it before, perhaps some coaches, reading some good books, Um and just making sure that you're you're touching those different areas inside the business. Do we need to talk about sales? Yes. We need to have a little bit of a strategy for sales. Do I need to hire 10 guys right now? Probably not. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, the, the word I was thinking you were going to use was self-awareness, right? This being aware of who you are and where you are in the process of your the growth of your business. And uh, when I'm small, I need, I need the basics and I need them in order so that I have a foundation to build off of. I don't need anything. I don't need anything and everything, but I need a way to understand my leadership. I need to understand the value of my culture from the perspective of, hey, this is where we're headed. So I can give everybody a North Star and, and get them all on the same page. Um, I need to understand the value of my process and, and the steps that it's going to go through at least at a milestone level, that it's going to go from here to here to here to here. And then that translates to each one of those aspects of our business, whether it be um, finance, accountability, marketing, sales, production, training, recruiting, hiring, onboarding, all of those things, there's a certain amount of depth we've got to go at the stage we're at in our business. And uh, that's been something that uh, we as a team have really uh, beat to death is re really the reason why I wanted to have this conversation today is uh, I feel like there's a lot of underserved contractors out there in our space these days. Um, we, uh, we tend to focus on these guys that are over a million, right? Like the sweet spot for most of these coaches and, and, and trainers and stuff like that are the guys that can afford it. That's really what it comes down to. I'm going to focus on the guys that can afford it because they can pay me, right? right. And uh, and so there's this group of contractors that um, they do what they can afford. They can afford to read books. They can afford to watch podcasts, hop on YouTube, maybe go to an event or two a year. And so what they're getting is shotgun information. It's shotgun information that isn't in any order. And because it's not in any order, they're – having to ask a question, which one do I do now? And a lot of times they don't do any of them, or if they do, they don't do it very well because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just initial information without any real guidance. And uh, so um, that's what we've been talking about around here. What can we do to help that contractor? What can we do to answer all those questions? The questions like, can you guys give me some of the questions that the guy that's under a million dollars asks? 
What are, what are some of those questions? How do I get all these hats off my head? Yeah. I would say that's the number one question I hear. Nathan, I do everything. I, I, I prospect, I close the sales, I build my orders, I, uh, I, uh, I deliver my materials, I go to the job site, I run materials, I do the final inspections, right? I close out the books and the job file. I can't, I can't do all that anymore. How, how in the world can I stop doing everything? So let's use that as a great example. That's one, of, that's one of the common questions that you get. And so you're at a show or you go read a book or a podcast or whatever, and it tells you, well, the number one thing you need to do is hire the people that you're not, uh, that are good at what you're not good at, right? Sounds like great advice. How do I do that? How do I identify that person? How do I set up a job description for that person? Uh, where do I find them? There's all these other questions that come back from that actual question that they have that, and then if I am going to hire them, how do I make sure they stay? How do I create a place that they want to be a part of? How do I lead that person? I've never led people before. So how do I get this person? to? That's a big one for me. How do I get my people to do what I want them to do? Yeah. And Jim, I'll add one more key one to what Nathan shared. I think Nathan, you probably, we've talked about this before, so I know you'd agree is, by the way, how do I, I'm at this weird stage. How do I keep this from ruining my family? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you get this uh, concept of, uh, you hear it all the time. I want balance in my life. And, uh, and Nathan and I have talked about this several times. Uh, so Dave, your first introduction to this. Um, I, I believe balance is uh, like a, a teeter-totter, not the scales of justice. Uh, scales of justice, we want balance, right? Equal 50-50. Teeter-totter, one dude's bigger than the other, right? And so that's just the equation. And right now, the dude that's bigger is your business. And so you get into this position of having to sacrifice something. You've got to sacrifice time that could be spent with your family, on yourself, or whatever it may be, in the hopes that you're going to build towards this freedom that you're looking for. That's what. That's why we all started business in the first place. If we're honest with ourselves, we want the freedom to do what we want, when we want to do it, and have the money to do it with. Yeah. Jim, if I can use another weird analogy with you, and you'll see where I'm going with this. So let's say you were a NFL owner, and um, you were just sick and tired of Belichick winning all these Super Bowls. Granted, he didn't have a good year this year, but, and I don't know if it was all Brady or him, but put that aside. And you said, you know what? I got all the money in the world. I'm, um, you know what I'm going to do? Instead of having a head coach and then an offensive coordinator and a defensive coordinator, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have, I'm going to hire four of the best defensive coordinators money can buy. One's going to be in charge of the first quarter. One's going to be in charge of the second quarter, one the third quarter, and one the fourth quarter. Belichick will never figure out what we're up to. You think it's going to work? Of course not. It's too complicated. But think of what so many contractors do. They go to this seminar over here. And that's one coordinator. They go to another one over here. That's another coordinator. Every time they talk to somebody, they get these different ideas. And you know why it doesn't work? It's too complicated and there's no synergy. At the end of the day, just like just like Tiger Woods would tell you, find the coach that you trust, whoever it is. And maybe it's frankly with contract to coach pro, maybe it's not. Find the coach that you trust and work through a synergistic system because at the end of the day, you know what the key to greatness is? It's making the complex simple. It's as a leader, understanding the complex and how every action you take affects these all these other things, but simplifying it so your organization can implement and execute it. Boy, the takeaway from that is simplification and synergy. Synergy between the aspects of your business. I mean, if you go get coaching from this sales coach over there and marketing advice from this marketing guy over here, and those two things don't line up, um, you're gonna you're gonna have some struggle. Like I see a lot of marketing coaches out there that are like, hey, you need to run these Facebook ads and they need to be like this and free assessment and free estimate and we'll give away a boat or whatever. You know, they got some way to generate leads like right this second. 
but my whole culture is built around serving the community um, and my sales process is built around the logical um, decisions by that homeowner, they don't line up. They don't, they don't go together. And we we, we've, we've talked today about the contractor, you know, in the stages of the, you know, the first three quarters of a million, then to the million and a half and two million. I'll, I'll hit another one that I, I've run across. There was a, you know, before I joined your organization, there was a contractor that paid me a lot of money. And they were in that next stage, that four to five million dollar stage. You know what happened at that stage? This owner was going, one, he had a lot of friends now that were very wealthy entrepreneurs. So he's asking everyone what they should do. And they got the latest tr- bag of tricks or whatever. And they're coming in to talk to his team. And then he's going to all these three, four, five days, you know, seminars for now the successful because he's now part of the successful hmm. and he comes back and then he and, and he keeps telling me i don't know why it's not all working i'm going you're driving your team crazy every t- they're scared when you come back home from anything <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they, they can't do it focus the key look one of the hardest parts to switching is and, and one of the first things nathan tell me if you don't agree when, when we're coaching some of our newer clients, one of the first things we're trying to get at is prioritizing because they're trying to chase everything. What else are we then trying to work on? Where do we prioritize the improvement? Because you can't improve everything at that at the same time. What do we then work on? Well, how do we increase certain parts of their business, sales, leads, whatever the key thing is? Then where do we go to? Well, guy, you got to lead. You got to communicate. You got to communicate effectively. You got to communicate clearly or you end up in chaos. Then what do we go to? Well, you going to develop the team underneath it to make this happen so it's ongoing. And you know what? One of the final key ones is, as a leader, you can't keep all that going unless you're helping your team achieve their dreams. Hmm. That's, that's really good. And I guess what I really heard from that is um, I feel like – because we get this question at events and stuff like that. Hey, what sales system should I use? Uh, what marketing uh, tactic or approach should I use? You know, th- that type of thing, right? Uh, what's the what's the right way to hire people? And I wore this shirt today for a reason because it really comes down to one thing. It's the one that you believe in, and the one that you believe in is the one that you're invested in. You had part of building. Um, it, it brought your concepts into place. Because um, if you try somebody else's thing, whatever that may be, uh, maybe somebody's sales system, and uh, you don't have success with it right away, you're going to say, yeah, that's all their fault. That system's stupid. I wasted a bunch of money. The reality is that system has worked for somebody or it wouldn't be being sold in most cases. And it worked for them, but you didn't believe in it. You didn't invest in it. You didn't get dedicated to it, persevere with it. And so that silver bullet didn't work for you. Now, if on the other hand, you worked with somebody to bring out your ideas and put them into an organized format that followed your way of thinking, it's amazing how persistent you will be to prove that that system works well. And that's really been our concept from the beginning is this, how do we take what they do best, their resources, talents, and skills and apply them to their own belief system because they'll be much more successful. And so I want, I want to get, I want to reel back in for just a second though. Um, we came to this epiphany, we were leaving people out. And uh, so in order to help those people, uh, it's been on our mind for a long time. I mean, probably two, three years we've discussed, hey, how do we help these people without doing it from the perspective of, um, being the rah-rah session or advice column because we get that a lot people call us they want to get coaching with us and uh they're like hey i'm in this group call because that's the really only way you can make it affordable and i understand the reason behind it is uh, in a group call but uh, a lot of these um, programs out there see how many people you can get into your group call like it could be 50 100 whatever number and uh and there's not a lot of value there. And then when they are there, it's uh, it's a rah-rah session or motivation deal. Like you just need to work harder. You need it, or it's advice. Like it's advice about whatever is bothering you at that point in time. I'm not getting enough leads. Okay, well you need to go talk to my marketing guy. Boom, and there's another thousand bucks, right? Instead, if you were to look at like, hey, I need more leads, and you went, well, 
um, how many referrals are you getting? What does that look like? Well, that you start to get to some answers like Dave talks about with the customer experience. Well, if the customer experience isn't good, well, we need to take a few steps back before we really focus on what it is that you think you need right now. And uh, I don't think there's a place for that. I don't, I don't think there's many programs that are out there like it. Um, so what we've done is uh, we've been working behind the scenes, putting some things together, and uh, we're, we're going to do this thing. Um, I, I don't have an exact release date yet, but uh, we want to do something where there's a little bit more order to it so that when you ask a question, we're not just looking at that question, we're looking at what led to that question and, uh, and identifying some issues, right? What, what are those issues um, that uh, the contractors deal with? And then giving that advice at the right time and right place for a contractor to be successful. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and, and I'm not trying to make this podcast into a sales pitch, but if you are a contractor that you feel like you've gone out there and you've asked the questions over and over and over again, you've been to the events and you've gotten all the information it still just isn't working for you, I, I strongly encourage you to come check it out. It's called Contractor Boost. Come check it out. We'll put the link in the description of the podcast here. Uh, we've made it very affordable. It'll be small groups so people get attention. Uh, there won't be any more than 20 contractors. So that's all we're going to put into the group. And uh, and there's going to be some benefits to that. First off, you get the benefits of all of our coaches. We're really and truthfully an executive team uh, that can help you in all aspects of your business. Everything from leadership and culture to finance and accountability to HR, um, recruiting and hiring, marketing, sales, you name it. We can kind of get answer those questions, but we're going to be answering those questions through a lens. What do you need for your business at the time and place for your business? Which I think is the most important aspect of all of this. The looking through this lens of being aware of where you are as a contractor. Um, We tend to want to go out there and get this amazing, unbelievable sales system, and we don't even understand how to use it. So we don't know how to coach it. We don't know how to teach it. And really what we need is to understand how can we differentiate ourselves? Because if we can differentiate ourselves or use uh, a product or tool that allows us to differentiate ourselves, that could shorten that curve. Would you guys agree with that? Like this, the, the approach that we're taking with this is a little bit different than what you might see in the normal group coaching type thing. It's a, it, we, have to, we have to almost nozzle it, right? Not too much, but not too little for where you are in, in the place and time that you are in the area that you need. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and frankly, Jim, I mean, our, our core business is one-on-one coaching, but hey, you know what Boost does? <laughs> it helps get people to the place where they believe, A, coaching can help, and B, long-term, they grow to the business like the Tiger Woods of this industry. And we work with them one-on-one at some point, some of them. And that'd be great too. Yeah. This program will certainly be enough to get a contractor to two or three million bucks. Okay. That's what it's focused on. It's focused on giving those guys that are the under our whole thing. If you guys don't know anything about Contractor Coach Pro, we have some core values around here that are super important to us. Our core values are to love, serve, and care. Um, and, and so this has been heavy on my heart of how do we care for the majority of contractors? Nine out of 10 contractors don't hit a million bucks and they're not being served very well uh, by the, the coaches and teachers and mentors in our industry, other than in their particular area of expertise, they do a fine job. They're great. There's a lot of really good ones out there, but we all have these questions of when and where. And then the big question of why, why should I do this culture thing when all I really want to do is get some leads and sell some more jobs? Well, if you get some more leads, you're going to have to hire some more salespeople and you're going to sell some more jobs. Those are going to come into a system that isn't structured. And so you're going to start to have breaks and have unhappy customers, unhappy people, because you didn't say, hey, this is what our culture was about first. Jim, it's sort of like being a good chiropractor, right? What does a good chiropractor do? And, and why do some people go to a chiropractor? 
because they consider holistically the entire body and don't try to work on just one part or the other part, right? It's also why, you know, in a medical system, you go to one primary doctor. And even if you go to the specialist, the primary doctor stays involved. Think about doing the opposite way where you only focus on one thing or you have multiple doctors involved. Neither of those work. So it's, like, see- it's like saying I'm sick and going to a podiatrist. Yeah, yeah. But it's not your foot that hurts, right? And you think it's your foot that hurts, but it's not really your foot that hurts. Right? It's something going on in your back. Um, so that's a pretty good analogy. I record this initiative because to your point, it allows us to help the contractors who really would benefit from a lot of what we're doing, but puts it in a way that it's affordable for them to get involved. So, so we've talked about the guys under a million and we've talked a little bit about the guys hitting up to 3 million. You know, you, that's the next stage is going from a million to 3 million. You get, a, you know, friends and family involved. And then you start to hire people you don't know. And so that puts in a whole nother uh, uh, wrench in the works. What, what should those, those guys go on? Because we usually see it. Um, there's a death valley in all this. And I want to see if you guys agree with me. Uh, if you operate under three million, you can be really streamlined, low overhead, low cost, highly profitable. Things are wonderful, um, and not a whole lot of headaches or even customers that are headaches. But then you make this decision: I want to go big. Okay? I want to. I, I want the recognition. I want to make the top one hundred. Whatever the reason is, I want to be a hundred million dollar. Hear that one all the time. I want to be a hundred million dollar contractor. I'm always like, why? Why do you want to be a hundred million? What does that do for you? And so. There's this death valley, at least in what I've been able to see and through my own experience as a contractor, from 3 million to about 10, 12 million, somewhere in there, between 10 and 12 million, that the overhead and infrastructure that I've got to put in place to take that next growth step is pretty immense. You've got a lot more people involved. You got production managers, you've got administrative people, you've got uh, project coordinators, you've got you're staging out the process for sales and you might have people knocking doors and you might have people selling, you might have other people collecting money. And so you're putting in all of this um, structure into your business that cost overhead. And um, that'll get you to that 10 or 12 million. But can you make it through the amount of time that it takes to go? Because if you don't do it fairly quickly, and I usually say you need to get through that in about two years, the amount of money you're making doesn't make all the chaos and stress and all that stuff worth the while because you're developing new systems, new procedures, you're unifying things and turning them into a well oiled machine. And, uh, but once you get to 12 million, 10 or 12 million, somewhere in there, that process that you've built, that structure, that foundation can take you far beyond that. That same core structure that you have probably up into the 25, $30 million range before you have to kind of break through the next barrier. Would you guys agree that those are kind of like three and then 10 and then 25, or is that uh, not the experience? I'm open for discussion. Man, I really think it depends on, it really depends on how strong of a leader you are to begin with. And how uh, how organized you can be as quickly as possible. I mean, I, I think that I think that somebody um, who is really well planned could be highly efficient and highly profitable. You know, from from three to ten, if they wanted to be, if that's what they planned to do. Um, I, so. Um, I heard somebody, it was actually, it was Paul Reed actually, who said it at the American contractor summit. When, uh, when I asked the question of this group, is there a sweet spot number and Paul Reed, so shout out to Paul had said that the sweet spot number is me hitting whatever number I planned and set up to hit. So in other words, if he came in under the number he was built to hit, he didn't make real great money and, and uh, his overhead was too high. If he came in over the number that he planned to hit, then his people were probably getting burned out and they were overtaxed and there wasn't enough staff to handle that volume. So I do believe that you could do very well in that quote unquote death valley area, assuming that you plan for it uh, and you, and you set yourself to get there. Um, oftentimes, 
Um, especially, especially if you're in an area with a storm, you find yourself getting blown up. And that was not your intention. You weren't planning for that thing to happen. And then something happened and you got to get while the getting's good and everybody's running around like crazy. Um, and so sometimes those retail guys have an advantage in that they don't deal with the storms or expect the storms uh, if you're if you're set up that way. And it's actually a little easier to plan. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that it is possible to set up a process and hire and ratio your overhead to revenue numbers to be efficient and and, and profitable at almost any number. I'll add to that a little bit. Now, I'll start out with a quick little story. I remember it had a big impact on me. And it was this. I was asked at a meeting when, way back when I was at Johnson Johnson. And the person said, I want you to write down or think about every statue you've ever seen. I'm thinking about all the statues I had ever seen. And the person said, okay. Have you ever seen a statue built for anybody other than someone who handled a crisis really well. And the point of the story was, you don't really know how good a leader you've become until you see how you deal with and your organization deals with a crisis. Hmm. Right? So then that goes to, well, what are the underlying things that helps an organization, a team, a leader build resiliency inside that organization. And when you start thinking about resiliency, Jim, we've used the word culture, you know, and, and we've now educated Nathan on the official wording, which is culture eat strategy for lunch. <laughs> but, but when you really think about it, what is culture? It's beliefs. It's beliefs that what we do is important. It's beliefs that what I'm part of, I belong. It's beliefs that I trust and enjoy the team I'm around. It's beliefs that this is the right place for me to be at the right time. It's those sets of beliefs that creates that resiliency. And it's the processes and the habits and the discipline that goes behind that creates the great organizations and demonstrates the great leadership. Yeah. I'm, I want to go back to Nathan on, on, on this particular one. The, the, that's great insight. That we, and, and Paul Reed, obviously the inspiration for it, that what you plan for, um, as long as you've planned for it, um, uh, it can be very profitable. Um, whether you're at three or 10 or seven or six, um, as long as you've got a plan for it. Now, if you're looking at expansion and growing and growing and growing beyond those numbers, you're planning out in advance, right? You're saying, hey, this year I got to do this because I'm going to hit that over there in three years or five years or whatever the number it's going to be. And so you may put some pressure on yourself um, in that in that particular space uh, between those, those numbers uh, in the plans for that bigger growth. We're at we're we're in an hour here, so you know we, we can only hold people's attention for so long here on Contractor uh, Radio. But if I heard things correctly today, and I'll let you guys kind of wrap it up for me. Um, we tend to, as contractors, be very good at two or three things, and that's why we say, "Hey, we want to go start a business." We go start a business, and we realize there's more things we need to be really good at. We need to be really good leaders. We got to have a great culture. We got to understand our finances and, and all these other things. Um, I got to be great at recruiting people and hiring people and, and bringing them into my organization. I got to be good at building processes and systems. And uh, normally that's not what we're all great at. And so where do I find the help? And so uh, whether it's us or anybody else, we're here to help and serve you. And uh, hopefully you can find that information out there. Uh, get where you understand the order of things, um, and you can certainly get that information from us. We'll sit down with you and do a free strategy call with you at any point. Just go to our website and fill out our assessment, and uh, you'll get to meet with Dave or Nathan or myself, and uh, we can walk you through that order of things where you need to be kind of focused. The other thing I heard today is um, stop chasing the shiny objects and silver bullets. Uh, get focused and keep things simple and synergistic. Uh, make sure that everything goes together 
um, it's, it's a big puzzle. And your job is to put those puzzle pieces together as that leader and get everybody on board for building the puzzle together. Hey, we got this cool puzzle piece, this sales thing. How does that work with everything else that we do? Hey, we've got this cool puzzle piece of how we're going to hold everybody accountable. How do we build that together and make that thing amazing? I think that's what I heard today, that uh, I got to keep it simple, stay focused, synergistic, understand the order of things, and that there is help out there if you're looking for it. Don't let your pride stand in the way. That's one of those things that we see an awful lot is I'm going to figure this out on my own. I'm one of those people. I My, my dad, who just passed away, would be one that would tell you that about me, um, that I am the type of person I'm going to figure this out on my own if it kills me. And, uh, and what I found is it put way too much stress, way too much con- uh, conflict in my life, got me out of balance a lot of times with my own family. And uh, uh, I realized there was help out there, whether it's a book, a podcast, whatever it is. Um, you can find the information if you want it badly enough. Don't have so much pride that um, uh, it gets in your way. Guys, what would your advice be to a guy um, that's looking to grow his business first step in doing so? Mine would be at 100,000 feet. Understand what your personal dream is and design your business as a vehicle to help you achieve your dream. And don't think of your personal dream and your business as two totally separate things. They're integrated. They have to be synergistic or both will end up a failure. Absolutely. Nathan? Uh, Super practical, write this thing kind of thing down and go do it immediately. Uh, Build a step-by-step process. If you're going to build a team, you got to be able to tell them what to do um, and what they should do. And you should be able to hand it to them and they should be able to reference it rather than having to call you. So build a step-by-step process. Perfect. Uh, Two amazing pieces of advice. Guys, um, thanks for hanging out today. Well, we don't get to do this very often on podcast stuff. So it's uh, it's cool to get to hang out with uh, some of my own peeps uh, here. And uh, we find great value in you. Uh, the uh, value you add to the contractors we coach is uh, not something you can put a dollar figure on for sure. And uh, we truly appreciate you. Thanks for being on Contract Radio today. Thank you. Enjoy it. See you. All right, everybody. Um, that was uh, two of our coaches, Coach Nathan Thibodeau and Dave Harrison from Contractor Radio, talking about the stages. Uh, that we go through as contractors, a lot of the issues we face, the obstacles we run into, and uh, we could not possibly fit that all into an hour. Uh, There's everything under the sun, insurance and legal and uh, insurance, it's not insurance, your finances, like there's so many other things that there's all these questions about. And if you've got a lot of questions about running your business, Um, feel free. We do this for free because we truly do care about our industry. Hop on our website, click the free assessment button, take the assessment and get a free coaching call from us. We will address those areas in your business that need some immediate attention and then what you might need to do uh, for the future to position yourself uh, the right way to grow your business and hopefully achieve that personal and financial freedom that you're chasing. Please check out our Contractor Boost program. Uh, If you're under a million bucks and you're trying to figure it out and you got a billion questions, uh, you need some order to what you do, you need a plan to what you're doing, and you need some measurement to what you do, uh, Contractor Boost could be the right answer for you. And uh, go to our website, check that out as well. Uh, We are here to um, make this industry a better place, a place that we can be proud of uh, to say that we are professionals. Uh, as contractors, uh, maybe to add a little bit of white to our blue collar. So uh, go check us out at contractorcoachpro.com. And uh, thanks for being here today. We appreciate your time. And uh, we'll see you in our next episode.